If you take out your notes this morning, uh, if you're guests with us, we have notes provided for you in the bulletin. So thought if you'd like to follow along with us, we're starting a new series on the study on the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm calling it Becoming Fully Devoted. So in the first series here, it's, we're looking at Become Who You Are. And what I want to talk to you about today is who do you belong to? The theme the Holy Spirit has given us for this year, 2020, is love God, love people. It only makes sense that to understand what it means to follow Jesus, we must see how does Jesus himself define what it means to love God, what it means to love people by studying how he actually did it as he lived here on earth. The section of scripture we'll be studying this week and next several months has typically been called the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably the best known part of the teaching of Jesus, though arguably it's the most misunderstood and certainly the less obeyed. What we are privileged to study to get today and for the next several months is the nearest thing to a manifesto that has ever been uttered. It's Jesus' own description of what it means to be his followers and what it means to be and to do. The church confesses that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah and that he has now come in the flesh. This is just what we celebrated through the entire month of December. Jesus is the Lord of the church and the world. He's the center not only of Christian faith, but also, the scripture asserts, of the universe itself, one through whom all things were made. Staggering sentence in the New Testament is Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. He, Jesus, existed before anything else, and he holds all of creation together. Now, you would think that the church Christians would be the most interested in knowing what Jesus says and means to follow him. And yet worldwide, the Sermon on the Mount, which is the largest block of his teachings that we have in the entire book of the Bible, is routinely ignored or it's misunderstood in the preaching and the teaching ministry of the church. Stassen and Gushy, in their book entitled Kingdom Ethics, they write this. This Evasion of the concrete teachings of Jesus has been seriously malformed Christian moral practices, moral beliefs, and moral witness. Jesus taught that the task of our discipleship is whether we act on his teachings, whether we put into practice his words. This is what it means to build your house on the rock, according to Jesus in Matthew 7, 24. I have a hunger more than ever before to become like Jesus. I want to put his words into practice. So I'd like you to read with me as we start off 2020 our mission and purpose here at CV Church. As I have prepared for this morning and for this very special series, Become Who You Are, I'm deeply moved by how our purpose as a local church is really what Jesus has outlined for us in Matthew chapter 7, chapter 5 through 7. Would you read our purpose statement out loud with me? Let's begin. The CV Church family exists to develop fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's discipleship. By connecting them with Father God, that's worship, the local church, fellowship, those we can serve, ministry, and people who do not yet know Jesus, evangelism. What is a fully devoted follower of Christ? It is a Christian who is or should be defined as one who humbles himself or herself, chooses to enter into discipleship, to follow Jesus' path, to build his or her life upon his teachings and his practices, even at a great cost, to pass those teaching and practices on to others, and thus to enjoy the unspeakable privilege of participating to advance God's reign. This afternoon, I just want to set up this marvelous Sermon on the Mount. I want to do it in two ways. I want us to discuss two major points. First one is, what is God's kingdom? What is that? What does it look like? And secondly, 
How are we to interpret the first 12 verses of Matthew 5, which is called the Beatitudes? In Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, John the Baptist arrives from the wilderness and hears his message. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew's very clear to let us know that the prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years earlier, predicted that John the Baptist would be the voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Well, he was preparing the way for Jesus Christ, who is God, who has always existed, who came to earth with a specific purpose in mind. Well, what was that purpose? He was bringing God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Those two terms mean the exact same thing, to earth in his own purpose. In Matthew 4, 17, we're told that Jesus comes on the scene. Now listen to what he says as compared to what John the Baptist says. For then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. In the original language, which is the Greek language, R.T. French writes this, the perfect tense means that which has completed the process of coming near. In other words, the kingdom's already present, not simply still on the way. In other words, in the person of Jesus Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, the God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, is now present on this planet. God is with us. Would you read out loud with me? Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. It's on the PowerPoint. Let's begin. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached the good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near or has come. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Now, to get the most out of the Sermon on the Mount, we can truly learn what does it mean to follow Jesus. We must understand what he meant by what the kingdom of God is. Why? Jesus said this is why he came. Loved ones, this is the reason why repentance is so important. What is repentance? It goes beyond me saying I'm sorry. Repentance is a total turning away of my own thought processes, what I think is right, what I think is the truth. It's turning away from my own will, what I want, what I desire, what my expectations are. And from pursuing my own selfish plan for my life, and it is to turn and to be receptive to God's purposes and God's plan, God's rule, and God's reign for my life. If you've been attending here for any length of time, you know that we take God's word and you personally reading it, very, very important. And in our devotions this morning, in the passage of John, Luke chapter 3, it's just really interesting when uh, John comes and he says, he looks at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and he does not have good words to say to them. He says, you brood of snakes, who warned you to flee from God's coming wrath? Prove the way that you, by the way you live that you have repented from your sins and turned to God. Then the crowd, so you have the religious elite, and he chides them, and he rebukes them. Then I like this, there you, if you're reading and you've got your eyes open, there's another group of people there, the crowds, and they said, well, what should we do? So now he starts talking to them about what does true repentance look like? What does it look like at an intellectual level? What does it look like at an emotional, pathos level? What does it look like in behavior? And he says this. And I I say this. There's a difference between biblical justice and social justice. We're confused in our culture. Social justice has been contaminated with a political agenda. Biblical justice has been something that God has spoke about from the book of Genesis all the way through. And this is what John the Baptist talks about. If you have two shirts, then give one to the poor. 
If you have food, then share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized. Tax collectors were those uh, Jews who were hired by the Roman authority, and they would say, here's what we want you to ask them for tax-wise. You can ask them for any amount over, and you can keep it. So if I owed $300 to the Roman Empire, the tax collector could charge me 1300 He would bag 1000 and he'd give 300 to the Roman Empire. He said, we don't care. Just make sure we get what we want. That's why they were so hated. Even these people showed up and listened to what John the Baptist said. Collect no more taxes than the government requires. That's biblical justice. John replied, the soldiers came and said, what should we do? Well, they hated the, the soldiers. He says this, don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with what you're paid. The kingdom of God, if you're truly a Christian, I heard a story the other day. This was going to be offensive to some of you. I don't mean it to be. It was just real life. This person was involved in the music industry and came to a church, not ours, and uh, there was worship going, and they just loved it. And this person said, Jesus is really effing real. Isn't that interesting? He's effing real. This person was taken, was titillated by the energy in the room and the music, but doesn't understand what it means to be a part of the kingdom. So as we move through 2020, you know there's an election coming. It's going to get hot and heavy in our culture. And if you want to just stick your head in the sand and say, well, you know, I don't care about politics, well, fine, but it, it cares about you. Yeah. So I recommend you don't at least stick your head in the sand. We need to be salt. We need to be light. So to get the Beatitudes in our hearts and minds, would you just follow along as I read uh, Matthew chapter 5, 1 to 12, and then we'll unpack this specifically next week. One day as the crowds were gathering, Jesus went up to the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, other translations, who are meek, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they shall see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and they persecute you and they lie about you and they say all sorts of evil against you because you are my followers. For some reason in the church, we think if we follow Jesus Christ, everything should just go our way. And Jesus said the reality of the animosity of the war between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light says that when you do and you become who God has created you to be, just know you're going to catch flack. And actually, in the concept of the kingdom, that's good news. If you're a Christian and you're out in the world and nobody is saying anything about your testimony, that's not good news. When your light shines, people are going to see it. And we would hope to think that everybody would be drawn to us and say, we want what you have. But most people won't. They'll be upset and disturbed and annoyed by what they see in you. That's what Jesus said. He said, be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So Jesus is getting his marching orders from God via the Old Testament. So look at point one with me. What is God's kingdom? We must ask this question because both John the Baptist and Jesus began their ministries by saying that the very person of Jesus Christ, 
Not Moses, not Buddha, not Mohammed, not Confucius, not Ron L. Hubbard. But in Jesus Christ, God's kingdom or the kingdom of heaven is now present on this earth. In other words, it's in the person of Jesus and what he did through his life, death, and God's kingdom has been revealed and unleashed in our world. So look at letter A. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God has to do with his rule. It has to do with his reign here on earth in and through Jesus Christ. Now, those aren't terms we normally use. So I like to try to make sure it's practical for every one of us. His rule, his reign means his agenda. We understand that term, right? Everybody says, well, everybody has an agenda. God has an agenda. It's called his rule. It's called his reign. He has priorities. He has purposes. And Jesus said, I came to earth to show you what those are and to demonstrate them for you so you, the church, can then go and act on those purposes. We experience his rule and reign through Jesus Christ. We experience his rule through the teachings and actual actions of Jesus. This is actually what Jesus was saying would happen in and through him in Luke 4, 16 to 21 and 23. It says this, When he came to the village of Nazareth, where he was born, his boyhood home, he went to the synagogue as usual. I don't know if you've thought of that before, but ever since he was a little boy, he would go to the synagogue on Sabbath every week. And he stood up to read the scriptures. He took the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet was handed to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me. That means he has empowered me. He has chosen me to bring the good news to the poor. For he has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released. The blind will see that the oppressed will be set free. And that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll. He handed it back to the attendant and he sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you have just heard has been fulfilled this very day. I mean, you guys, that, that is electrifying. Because what he's saying is from the book of Genesis to the end of the book of Malachi in the Old Testament, everything that's been written was written about the Messiah. And guess what? The Messiah is in your midst. You're still waiting for the rule. You're still waiting for the rain. You're still waiting for the presence of God. And guess what? In me, it's here. Wow. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. That was his central purpose and focus in life. I must declare what God's rule and God, what God's reign is. So when we see him in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's in prayer, And he says, is there any other way that this cup can pass? Because he knew what was coming. He knew the brutality. He knew the humiliation. He knew the horror. So here you have God's son who is fully God, fully human. And he says, is there any other way? But he knew that God's rule and God's reign, as much as it frees you, it also pens you in. There's certain things I can do. There's certain things I can't do. And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Why? Because he was all about the rule and the reign of God. In Matthew 11, 1 to 6, we're told that John the Baptist had been put in prison. Do you know why he'd been put in prison? Uh, I've been here 27 years, and every time we get into election cycle, you just know me. I'm, I'm going to say things about it. I cannot be still. I cannot. And I'll always get this. You're to preach the gospel. And there's no room for politics in the gospel. <laughs> and I always like to take them to the scriptures. And here's, here's one of my favorite ones. John the Baptist was beheaded because he poked his nose in the king's business. Herod had married Herodias, who was Herod's brother's wife. And she was his niece. So he committed adultery. 
he committed incest. John was not quiet about that. He says, what you're doing is wrong. And he pointed that finger. And when he got for it, he got his head beat, chomped off. When people say, well, we're not supposed to miss, mix business and politics. Politics is about people. Politics is people setting regulations for how we live. Nowadays, in America, both parties want to foist their will upon us. You can't just, you can't just lay down and be ignorant about this kind of stuff. Does that make sense? You know, some people just say, Christians, did you know a, a good portion of evangelicals? They're not even registered to vote. So can I just say this? How foolish. That's foolish. Well, your one vote's not going to make a difference in California. It will be for God. At least I'm fulfilling my duty. I'm fulfilling my responsibility to be part of the kingdom of God and be salt and light. Here's the issue. John the Baptist was in prison. And he's going, wait a minute. I just heard you read the scroll. You said you'd come to see people delivered out of bondage. You came to preach the good news. You came to heal. You came to raise people from the dead. Why am I your cousin? And I'm the front runner. I'm your front runner. I'm paving the way. Why am I in jail? He couldn't come to terms with it. He's sitting here going, this, did I get it wrong all along? I baptized this guy. Did I miss it? And here's was, was uh, Jesus' response. First of all, Gordon Fee writes one of the best things I've ever read on the kingdom of God. He says this, the presence of the kingdom in Jesus meant that the kingdom of God was a radically different order from people's expectations. It was not the overthrow of the hated Roman Empire. It was present in Jesus as he performed and the practices of the kingdom that Isaiah prophesied. So John the Baptist is in prison, and he says to his disciples, I need you to go ask Jesus a question. Here it was. They asked him, are you the Messiah? And Jesus told them, Go back to John and tell him what you've seen and heard. It's the same thing. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is being preached. You tell him. Now he's talking to his relative, and he's not afraid to confront anybody with the truth. Here's what he says to his beloved John the Baptist. God blesses those <clears throat> who do not turn away because of me. Not long after that answer, his head was cut off. I could go into a whole different strain of thought here, but how many times have I heard some of us here say, maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe Jesus isn't who he says he was. And when you ask, well, I prayed, and he didn't answer the prayers I wanted him to answer. My baby died. My spouse died. I've lost my job. Scott, I've got a diagnosis, and if something doesn't happen, I'm going to die. As if God's the criminal in this. And the truth is, in Hebrews chapter 11, it's called the Hall of Fame of Faith. You've got those who have said God used them, they raised the dead. They conquered nations, and he lists all these wonderful things. Then there were other people who, they died. Their, their spouses were killed. They were used as uh, light torches in Roman arenas. They were both heroes. The kingdom of God isn't about making me be better. It, the kingdom of God isn't about doing what I want him to do. The kingdom of God is about surrendering my life to my Savior who shed his blood on the cross for me. And am I going to participate in his kingdom rule and reign? 
John was basically asking, if you're the Messiah, why not come and just get me out of prison now? You've come to destroy the Israel's enemies, right? And Jesus says, not the way you think. Does anything in what I just read to you sound familiar concerning why Jesus said he came to earth that I read to you earlier? Yeah. Look at letter B. The seven leading characteristics that demonstrate how God's kingdom exists in our midst. God's kingdom is not a place, but action that is seen through deliverance and salvation. I want to just give you seven characteristics, and we'll unpack these during this series. The first actions of the kingdom of God is deliverance and salvation. I'm trusting God that we'll see more people come to Christ as we all learn to declare the good news of Jesus, that Jesus came so that your sins would be forgiven and that you could enter into a personal relationship with him and that you could experience his peace. You don't have to be at war with God anymore because he's not at war with you. He sent his son for you. Salvation and deliverance. Number two, righteousness and justice. God's justice, the kind of things we talked about. Not doing things for political expedience, but we join in the kingdom to see God's justice accomplished on his behalf for the people of this world. Peace. Somebody grabbed me just before the second service and wanted to have a chat with me and just said, I'm filled with fear all the time. Should this be happening? And I didn't say, you, you'd probably would think I'd say, well, of course I shouldn't. I said, no, fear is a normal aspect of life. But when it's interfering with your life, it's interfering with your marriage, it's interfering with your children, it's interfering with your emotional and relational and financial life. Satan doesn't want you to experience God's peace. But part of the kingdom of God is to have this deep, settled peace that you know God loves you, he accepts you, and he affirms you. He wants to appoint you and, and empower you to be who he's called you to be. Amen. The peace of God. Shalom. The wholeness of God. The well-being of God. Well-being does not mean that all my circumstances are going exactly the way I want them to go. You can have peace when you're sick. You can have peace when you've lost someone. You can have peace when your plans just go to smithereens. Because it's the peace of God that doesn't submit to situations. The peace of God is, is yours and my stabilizing factor. Joy. Joy are, is not based on my circumstances. You can have the joy of God and you can be in profound pain. You can have just committed one of the worst failures of your life and you can be filled with the joy of God. Because it's part of the kingdom. Don't you love that? God's presence, number five, is spirit or light. Have you ever had anybody just ever come up to you and just go, you know, what do you do for a living? Or they'll say, are you a Christian? I always like to go, what's the reason you ask? And they'll always say, there's just something different about you. You walk into the room, and it's just like, wow, things change. And I go, that is the peace. That is the presence of God. I don't take credit for it. It's his kingdom. Healing. God has called us to pray for healing. People come up to me and say, well, does everybody you pray for heal? No. No. I've prayed for people and they died. So does that mean I'm not going to pray anymore? Prayer isn't about you and I. It's about the kingdom of God. So I want to encourage you, whenever you encounter sickness, whenever you encounter difficult situations, you've got to listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to pray for healing. I believe it is God's will to heal every time. Does he? No. But that's not going to stop me from praying. 
If I don't pray for people because I'm afraid of my reputation, that's called faithlessness and fear. But when I lay hands on somebody, I'm doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't do it in the name of Scott. I've seen people heal the cancer. I've seen blind eyes heal. I've seen deaf ears open. I didn't do that. He does that, right? He does it through you and I. We're just ordinary. He's the extraordinary one here. So I want to encourage you. Be released. When you see hell raising its head, when you see all this negativity, you see all this depression, you see all kinds of things happening, we don't have to back down Step into it in the kingdom of God and, and, and allow him to release his kingdom resources through you. Because when you surrender your life to Jesus, you become a kingdom person. Isn't that beautiful? And then return from exile, restoration and reconciliation. I believe in the next several years, we're going to see more of a desperate group of people come. Some of you might not like who's coming. It's none of yours in my business. We are called to see people reconciled to Jesus Christ. Would you agree? The religious elite hated Jesus because of the people that followed him. Prostitutes followed him. Tax collectors followed him. Sexually disenfranchised people followed him. The strange and the weird followed him. Not because he was weird. It's because they knew his love. And they wanted to be impacted by him. I so long, church, for that to be our reality here. The people come in broken and busted up and doubled over. And we love them to Christ. We love them and we communicate the gospel. We communicate his love and his acceptance and his favor upon them and to see him work his kingdom purposes through them. See the blind healed. See the lame raised. See the dead raised. And don't make that metaphorical. Number two, how are we to interpret the Beatitudes? I just want to look at two points and then we'll celebrate community. Yeah. <clears throat> Letter A. Most people fall into this, whether you ever study it or not. It's called the idealistic interpretation. What do I mean by that? That's the letter A, the idealistic interpretation. This is the view that the Beatitudes were high ideals that Jesus expects us to live up to. If we mourn, if we only can be pure in heart, you kind of pump up that purity. You become a peace activist then good things are going to happen in your life. This is what's been called the ethics of idealism. Some Christian scholars call it the Beatitudes, the entrance requirement of the kingdom. It means this. If you're poor in the spirit, if you mourn, if you're humble, if you're merciful, then you can enter into the kingdom of God. I think this is how most of us in this room think. I had person after person say, you know, that's how I used to think until now I heard you. You most likely thought that this morning. As we're reading the Beatitudes, you could easily think, this is how I must act. We go right to doing. Here's the problem with this way of thinking. Look at number one. It focuses on our good works, not on the grace of God. Salvation is all about God giving us what we do not and cannot ever deserve. Salvation is what God does for us. We'll discuss this in the next several weeks where God expects us to participate in the kingdom of God. In Philippians 2.12, he says this, work to, hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. You know how most of us read this? Work hard to earn your salvation. And that's not what he's saying. Do you sense the difference in it? What he's basically saying is, if you've surrendered your life to Christ and the kingdom purposes live within you, then just make sure that you're applying yourself and your diligence so that the results of the kingdom are showing up in your life. If you're salt, you're going to be salty and people are going to get thirsty around you. If you're the light, 
Things that need to be exposed will be exposed. Things that need to be found will be found. Here's the second problem with this focus. It causes feelings of guilt and resistance. Oh, I failed again. Guess I must really not be part of the kingdom. It's not based on works. Number three, we tend to ignore or evade what Jesus says is true of us. Don't lift your hand. Don't shake your head. Don't, don't acknowledge anything that I'm saving. But how many of us, when you come to certain passages of Scripture and you know what it says, you, just, you go right over it because you don't like the demands, right? You know what it's going to say. I've been drinking too much, and I'm coming to a drinking section. I think I'll just skip right over that. I'm being sexually involved with someone that I shouldn't or I'm involved in some kind of sexual practice that I shouldn't be. I know what the scripture is going to say. I think I'll just flip right over that and then I don't have to be confronted with it. That's why I'm such a big advocate for reading through the Bible with us. That I have to be confronted with my own stuff, my own failures, my own sin. The Holy Spirit wants to speak to that. If you don't read the Bible, you won't. So many Christians have their favorite passages. Psalms 23. Who doesn't like that one? The Lord is my shepherd. Oh. You know, we get goosebumps when we read that kind of stuff. But it's the hardcore stuff we don't like. Okay, I'm meddling. I know it. Number four, it creates a sense of self-righteousness. If you struggle with criticism, if you struggle with condemnation, if you struggle looking at other people and judging them, that is a form of self-righteousness. I am better than you, therefore I have the right to condemn you. Unfortunately, that's what so many communities, the LGBTQ community, that's what they think of the average local church. You're just pointing your bony finger at us and you're damning us. Well, I don't agree with their agenda. I, th I think it's wrong. But I'm not going to sit there and point that out at this point. I want to get into their lives and love them, care for them. Many of them are really hurting. But, but they're not going to open up to you if they know you're a Christian. Unless you've earned their respect. Then they might be open to a conversation. Does that make sense? You walk in with a 20-pound Bible. Probably it's not going to work. <laughs> Number five, does not fit what Jesus taught. That's not what Jesus taught, that you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Look at letter B, grace-based prophetic interpretation. What does that mean? As we've discovered, the prophet Isaiah is quoted by Jesus and the rest of the New Testament authors. Did you know this? More than any other prophet in the Bible. Isaiah is quoted more than any other prophet in the Bible. We have seen the prophet Isaiah define what the kingdom of God is. It's a grace-based prophetic interpretation. So look at point number one. Beatitudes are to be interpreted as prophetic teachings, not wisdom teachings. What do I mean by that? Robert Gulick, who was a leading New Testament scholar, he writes this. Wisdom teaching emphasizes human action that is wise. And it fits God's way of ordering the world. Therefore, it gets good results. Prophetic teaching emphasizes God's action that delivers, rescues, frees, releases us from mourning into rejoicing. When's the last time did you just wake up out of a sound sleep or as you're interacting in the culture, you mourn and you weep because of the brokenness and because of the lostness of our culture. Not that we stand in judgment of them, but that we're broken hearted because we see what divorce does. We see what molestation does. We see what alcohol, drug addiction, sex addiction, food binging, we see what it does. It hurts people. If you haven't yet, you've got such a great gift coming to you. When you just sit there and you're overwhelmed with the lostness and you're mourning, God says, because you're participating in the kingdom, I'm going to turn your mourning into laughter. 
I will turn your mourning into joy. I will give you ways to reach into the community with my power and my purposes to see it change. Grace-based, not rule-based, not condemnation-based. I think Stason and Gushy asked the right question concerning these two distinct ways of interpretation. Is Jesus saying, happy are those who mourn? Because mourning makes them virtuous, and so they'll get the reward that virtuous people deserve? Or is Jesus saying, congratulations to those who mourn because God is gracious and God is acting to deliver us from our sorrows? I have many people. I just had somebody recently come say, you know, Scott, I've got all these fears, and, and I feel like I'm, I'm going crazy. I'm so paranoid, but I refuse to embrace it, and I refuse to acknowledge it. And I said, dear friend, that's what's causing your paranoia. I said, what you're fearing is you fear talking to somebody like me and just being open and just saying, Scott, I can't control my thoughts. I'm out of control. I'm addicted to fear. I'm addicted to worry. I'm addicted to sexual images. I can't stop it. <laughs> and I said, well, the beginning is just to confess it. Before we were done, I said, so how are you feeling now? What, what, where was your you know, zero to 10 fear coming in here? 10. Where is it now? Two. I said, do you see how that works? You be open. You be honest. I'm not going to condemn you. You've got to make sure you find people that won't condemn you. Right? You know, you go to somebody and say, you know, I've been looking at, and they'll go, well, you just need to stop it. <laughs> Don't talk to people like that. No. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, I'm just, I'm drinking so much, I'm passing out. Well, you fool, what are you doing that for? You'll never help anybody that way. No. Right? Yeah. Grace-based. Number two. Beatitudes speak to disciples who are being made participants of the kingdom and the presence of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. They're being made participants in the kingdom. You're being exposed to the gospel, and Jesus Christ says, I invite you to come and, and, and have your sins forgiven. Be filled with my peace and my power. And you say, yes. That's grace-based. Three, Beatitudes do not promise distant well-being and success. A lot of Christianity today, you do this and you do this, and you will be a guaranteed success. That's not what the gospel is. What the Beatitudes do is they congratulate disciples because God is already acting to deliver them. He's already acting. We sang the song today, didn't we? Even when it doesn't feel like it's working. Even it does da bum 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 uh, li Little uh, Brady. Every now and then, if you watch me, he'll dip. <laughs> I'm just hoping the words get into his heart. But just because you don't feel it, just because you don't see him, it doesn't mean he's not working. There's a song that says, when it all goes dark, and you can't see his hand, you can trust his heart. More to say about that, but don't have the time. Number four, Beatitudes are based on the coming of God's grace experienced in Jesus, not on the perfection of the disciples. Uh, I love uh, CR and Celebrate Recovery. One of the things we say in that community is we're not looking for perfection. God's looking for progress. Right? Not looking for perfection. He's looking for progress. Ushers, would you please come? If you're here today and you would be uncomfortable, maybe you're a guest or maybe you've been attending, but when we come to the communion table, you, you don't really want to, to participate, please feel no pressure whatsoever. If the plate comes to you and you don't want to take the bread, you don't want to take the cup of juice, just pass it on by. And don't worry about that, okay? Would you follow along? Uh, I'm going to read the communion passage, and then we're going to celebrate communion, and then we'll be done for today. 
This is Mark 14, 22 to 25. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and he gave it to the disciples. Come on, come on down, guys. Let me wait. I'm getting ahead of everybody. Yeah, come on. Come on down. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your service. Deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Alan, will you grab me a communion? Let me read the scriptures. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take thee, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and then they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It's poured out as a sacrifice for many. Now I tell you the truth. I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Thank you, Alan. You would not believe how many of these I have spilled on myself throughout 27 years. It used to be uh, when arthritis was so bad, thank God I don't have it now, but uh, every month I'd go to drink it and my arm would lock up right here and I'd throw it in my face. <laughs> Week, after month, after month, after month. And you go, well, aren't you smarter than that? I'd just forget until I threw the juice on my thigh. Oh, I could have had a V8, you know, it's just... Listen to what Roman 8 says, because this has to do with the bread. There's now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. And because we belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. Now, listen, this has to do with what we're celebrating with this cracker. So God did what the law could not do. What did he do? He sent his son in a body just like ours that we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by his son's sacrifice for our sins. In other words... The bread represents when he says, this is my body. What he's saying is, the way I'm going to destroy sin and I'm going to destroy Satan's power over you is, I'm going to take a human body like yours and I'm going to allow them to, I'm going, God the Father saying, I'm going to place the people's sin on your body as a sacrifice. This is powerful. Romans 5, 17 says, For he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. He was the Lamb of God that was slain for you and I. So when we take this cracker, it's not turning into the body of Christ. That's not what it is. Jesus never meant that. If you grew up with that, I'm sorry. It was a metaphor. He says, when you take this and you go to eat this, Know that what you're doing is you are identifying, acknowledging that Jesus bore the curse of your rebellion and your sin on him. And he broke its power over your life when he died on the cross and Father God raised him from the dead. That is very powerful. If you can, you'd like to, would you raise your cracker with me? Father, we just thank you for your love for us and Jesus Thank you. Thank you that you were willing to present your body, the book of Hebrews says, as a sacrifice for the human family. And by doing so, you broke the power of sin in our sin nature. You broke it. You destroyed it as we confess you as our Lord and Savior. So we eat to celebrate what you accomplished on the cross for us so that we could become sons and daughters of the living God. It's in your name we pray. Asitia. And in this text, it says that uh, when Jesus took the cup, he says that's the shedding of his blood that was about to happen. 
is what confirms the purpose of God sending Jesus that he said there's going to be a day when you won't kill animals anymore. That's not necessary because animal blood was a foreshadowing. It could never for cleanse our conscience. Listen, if you struggle with a guilty conscience, when you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the scripture says there's, there's therefore now no condemnation. You're not at war with God. You're at peace. You can be free of those things that haunt you, that go bump in the night in your conscience because of what Jesus has accomplished. It's God on the cross taking our place. Isn't that good news? If you haven't made that decision yet to surrender your life to him, I encourage you, it's the most important eternal decision you will ever make. <clears throat> Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you were willing to come and you allowed them to treat you in the most horrific, dehumanizing, destructive way possible. But you knew the Father's plan and you trusted him enough that you knew he would not allow you to stay dead, but that he would resurrect you from the dead. And that Jesus, that is the sign for us that you're going to come back someday. And every one of us that have placed our trust in you, we've confessed you as our Lord and Savior, we will rise up with you to a new heaven, new earth, to live in the kingdom forever. Thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's drink together.